There's a diagnosis that no one ever wants to hear for themselves or for a loved one, cancer. But as bad as that news can be, the good news is that today there are cutting edge treatments that provide excellent outcomes for cancer patients. And they're available without ever leaving Irving. This special edition of Irving Living focuses on what you need to know about cancer and where you can go for help. Today you'll meet surgeons and physicians from all over the city who help demystify the disease and show you the latest medical technology. But first, we'll hear from Dr. Carol Boss, Irving Board of Health and cancer survivor. Hi, I'm Dr. Carol Boss. I'm a cancer research advocate and I'm also a member of the Irving Board of Health. I have a background in biomedical engineering, that's what my PhD is in. I had worked in medical research prior to um, starting my family. So after my own diagnosis with breast cancer, what I did was I took that research background and that knowledge of medicine and I have applied it to um, what we call research advocacy. We want to include the patient perspective in medical research because the patient's at the heart of all this. We're not talking about cells in a petri dish. We're not talking about, you know, rats or mice or, or anything like that. We're talking about real people. So to, to have a person who has experienced cancer, either through their own personal experience or that of a, a loved one, is a very it's a huge reminder to the research community of not only the importance of their work, you know, the relevance of it, but also the immediacy. There's a huge, huge area of uh, great discovery in terms of cancer research. And one of the things that I get to do is, as a, as a research advocate, I sit on these decision-making panels as to what type of research gets funded. So I get to see all of the research that's, you know, that's coming out and help to guide the way that we're going to go in the future. One of the areas of research that's becoming increasingly important is prevention. So let's, instead of talking about treating cancer, let's talk about why we get it in the first place. You know, are there environmental factors? Is it, is it genetic basis? What exactly is causing this? So if we can attack cancer from a prevention standpoint, then we don't even have to worry about you know, everything else. In terms of, of, of where we're going with cancer research in other areas, we need to look at the, the underpinnings of cancer. We need to look at how it happens on a very basic level, because if we can figure that out, we may actually be able to find a cure. Welcome to the Baylor Irving Cancer Center. I'm Dr. Anand Shabnani, Medical Director for Radiation Oncology. The Irving Cancer Center really is no different than any other aspect of this hospital, which is Irving's Community Hospital. It was founded that as Irving Community Hospital. It continues to be the hospital, and it really takes its direction when it develops service lines, whether it's cardiac or cancer, from visionary leaders. So you can go back in late 80s, I'm sure that, that those, the board members, cancer physicians, were saying, why do our patients in Irving have to drive anywhere else? And they answered their own question by saying they, they shouldn't. And that's why they developed a cancer center here. And so when it opened in 1991, Marilyn Quayle, the, then the um, vice president's wife, came uh, to speak and dedicate our cancer center. And from that time forward, uh, they have developed programs to respond to the needs of patients. I always say, if, you're, if your confidence is somewhere else, if it's in Baltimore or in Houston, and you want to go to those cancer centers, then go because your confidence is there. But for the people of Irving, I think most of them know they don't have to travel to find those services. It is right here in their backyard. Um, really remarkable advances over the last 20 years. Well, when patients are relaxed, they're more likely to hold still for their treatment. So we want them to be as comfortable as possible when they're lying on that table because they're more likely to hold still um, and, and tolerate the treatment. 
Um, a few things that we do are that we have a fish pond for them to look at when they're coming in. They have music to listen to. And they have something relaxing to look at. So we think hopefully after the first few treatments, when they're more comfortable, more relaxed, then they're more likely to hold still. And our therapists work very hard to try to put them at ease. And over time, usually that after that first you know, one or two treatments, hopefully they're a little bit more comfortable. Um, so that for the rest of their treatment, you know, if they're going through something like this, we're, we're making them as comfortable as they can be. This machine is a linear accelerator, and that's the machine that we use to deliver radiation. Radiation is just one component in a patient's cancer treatment. Usually there are three different ways that we can treat somebody's cancer. There's surgery, there's chemotherapy, and there's radiation. And depending on what type of cancer they have, what stage we're dealing with, that's how we determine which treatment fits in the right place. Uh, for example, if you have a woman with breast cancer, typically they'll have surgery first, and then if needed they may have chemotherapy, and then at the very end is radiation, which basically involves giving high energy x-rays to destroy any microscopic cells that may be left behind. The most recent equipment that we added, of course, I've mentioned is the IGRT. And visually, the best way I can explain what it does and why we were so excited to ask donors to help us buy it is, if this is a tumor, this is the way we used to do radiation. It hit the tumor, but it also hit the area around the tumor. IGRT focuses that beam. So you really are sparing that tissue, that surrounding tissue, you're hitting it. And with gating technology, Dr. Shivnani may have mentioned that, when the tumor moves, it stops delivering. It only delivers the radiation when the tumor is in view. So you can deliver a much higher dose of radiation and save and spare that surrounding tissue. It's called image-guided radiation therapy. And so we use this often in prostate cancer because as you know or can imagine the prostate can move every day during treatment as uh, air goes into the colon or as the bladder fills. So it can move a little bit each day. Uh, we use it for lung cancer, uh, we use it for head and neck cancer and certain types of brain tumors. And typically in situations like lung cancer we just had to give ourselves more margin, more room for air because the tumors may move during their, their treatment. It's the traditional way that we've set up patients. We, we use skin marks, permanent skin marks. Sometimes they're referred to as radiation tattoos. Now with this technology, we're able to better see the, treat, the tumor at the time of treatment so that if we need to make any adjustments, we can do it right then and there so that we're hopefully better targeting their tumor and, and thereby minimizing some of the side effects from the treatment because radiation can affect both normal cells and cancer cells. Normal cells can tolerate a certain amount of radiation, but if they get too much radiation or if they're too damaged by radiation, then that leads to side effects that can affect the patient's quality of life. So for example, radiation can damage the normal lung tissue around a tumor, and we want to try to keep the risks of that damage to as little as possible. So if we can be more accurate in how we're aiming the radiation beam, then we think we can keep those risks down. So this machine we had before, but what we've added are these two arms on the side of the machine and that allows us to deliver what we call image guided radiation and so what that means is that a patient will lie on this table and before their treatment will either take some x-rays or the machine will turn around them and do basically a CT scan in here in real time and we can see where their tumor is located we can see where the normal structures are located uh, and we can basically make small adjustments if we need to before we actually turn the machine on and deliver their treatment. President Nixon declared war on cancer in the 70s. So the great news is we, the world was moving to try to figure out how to more specifically treat it. We were able to take advantage of that. And the reason that Irving's cancer center, the Irving Cancer Center here at Baylor Medical Center, Irving was able to do it, was good planning, good fiscal management, great leadership from administration. But I'm going to have to say, as the president of the foundation, you also have to look at the role that philanthropy pay, played. Cancer equipment is so expensive. Uh, let me give you a, an example. It cost $3 million to build and equip this hospital in 1964. We just bought a piece of, one piece of equipment that was a million three in 2012. So philanthropy actually uh, allows the hospital to look at some of these options. Uh, the hospital will come to me and they'll say, John, we have this great piece of equipment, but it's a million three. We think after 
all of our bills were paid and we've cared for the needy and all those things, we can come up with 700 of that. But we really need you to carry five to 600,000 of that. And so that's, that's the case that I then take to our community and say, if you want it in your town, we can have it. But philanthropy has to be part of that. And the donors in Irving have responded to that. I mean, millions and millions of dollars through the years. Partners like the Four Seasons with $2.3 million. For us, it began in 1992, which was about 25 years ago, that we got involved with the Irving Healthcare Foundation uh, and donating money from the Four Seasons. We have raised a little over $2 million, and 100% of that money has gone towards the purchase or assisting the purchase of cancer equipment and also staff members here at the Cancer Center, including a nurse navigator, which is someone that assists a, a patient through the course of their visit, you know, the physicians that they have to visit in the course of their treatments so that they just have a better sense of what to expect next and all of their information sticks with them throughout the process. And it's sort of like a concierge, but it was the first location to actually have that position here in Irving throughout the Baylor Healthcare System Network. Perfect example of how people give. We had more than 190 of our employees here at the hospital. They are the gift. They come to work here, but then they also give from their paychecks. Um, we had 190 of, of, of a thousand people last year during the employee campaign give to the IGRT equipment. And those were gifts of five dollars, twenty-five dollars, fifty, so and there's no such thing as a small gift. It's a gift, whether it is this fifty thousand dollars or 150 from a foundation or 300,000 from the Four Seasons or that $25 gift. They all work together to be the 540, 540,000 that we use to get that equipment and say, yes, it's here. You don't have to travel anywhere else. You can find it right here in your hometown. Well, just like John mentioned, it's important that the members of our community have this ability to come to their local cancer center, their local hospital, to get this sort of care that is so advanced. And we feel the same way about our uh, employees and our club members and our vendors and folks that are local, that they should have that same ability to come get the care right outside their back door. It's all about birthdays and anniversaries uh, way down the road. and, and you. You, you did, your cancer is something you manage or you've cured. Colon cancer is a malignant growth in the lining of the colon. Anytime you have a malignant growth, it has tendency to spread anywhere in the body and by doing so destroys that part of the body and eventually leads to death. This is what an early cancer looks like. Uh, early cancer usually means it has not spread spread beyond the wall. So patients who have colon cancer, early stage, by removing cancer, is curable. However, if this cancer has spread beyond the wall and in stage three and four, the newer chemotherapy uh, does help and prolongs life, but may not be curable. Fortunately, colon cancer is preventable because it starts off as a small polyp and it takes several years, sometimes seven to 10 years before a polyp can become cancer. Here, uh, this is what the uh, benign polyp looks like. Uh, if you don't remove the polyp at this stage, you continue to grow and become cancer. By doing procedures such as colonoscopy, we can remove the polyp, and by removing polyp, we interrupt the cycle. In order to do colonoscopy, one has to have a bowel prep day before the test. Usually we recommend patients to stay on a clear liquid diet and then in the evening have a bowel prep. I usually use a two liter bowel prep where patients drink one liter of the bowel prep at five o'clock and another liter at nine o'clock. I do recommend patients to drink plenty of fluid to clean out the colon. And following day, the procedure is usually done at the, at the endoscopy center in the hospital or outpatient setting. Uh, sedation is usually given, uh, therefore the patient does not feel any pain or discomfort. Colonoscopy is a procedure where we introduce a flexible scope through the rectum all the way 
up to the cecum, which is the beginning of the colon. The best procedure is colonoscopy because it examines your colon thoroughly, uh, entire length of the colon. If any polyp is found, they are removed at the same time. As we pull the scope out, we carefully examine entire length of the colon for polyps or any other abnormal finding. When we see a polyp, we remove the polyp by introducing an instrument through the scope called snare and we snare the polyp and remove it by applying electric current. Sometimes we pinch off the polyp. If the polyp is small, the entire polyp could be removed with a biopsy forcer. Colonoscopy is invasive test. Uh, there is a small risk of complication such as bleeding and bowel perforation. However, the incidence is very, very small. Fortunately, we have made tremendous stride in the management of cancer, particularly in colon. Incidence of colon cancer in America has markedly reduced over several years because of colon cancer screening. American Cancer Society recommends that everyone uh, average risk should do colonoscopy age 50. Patients who are higher risk of colon cancer should do colonoscopy age 40 or even earlier. Uh, patients who are high risk of colon cancer are the one who had colon cancer before or family history of colon cancer or polyp. Uh, patients who have inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis are also increased risk of uh, colon cancer and family history of colon cancer where they have inherited a genetic defect uh, they should do colon cancer screening much earlier age as early as 10 to 20 years of age at any age if you have a symptoms where you notice change in your bowel habit uh, they become irregular or if you notice your stool have changed in size shape uh, or color or if you develop, if you notice blood in your stool, uh, or if your doctor tells you you're anemic or you're losing weight, those are serious signs. And therefore, a thorough examination should be performed, which may include blood tests, x-rays, and even colonoscopy. There are several things one can do. Number one is diet. Uh, it's well known diet high in vegetables and fruit would reduce the incidence of colon cancer. Uh, exercise is another factor. Uh, interestingly, we find that patients who are active have less incidence of colon cancer and therefore the patients who are overweight also have higher incidence of colon cancer and they have higher risk of dying of colon cancer. Uh, so reducing weight, exercise and diet uh, are the three most important factors. Obviously, the first goal here is to get rid of the cancer. But one of the scary factors is uh, a very feminine part of your body, an identifier of your gender, is missing. So that being addressed nowadays with all the different types of reconstruction, I think makes a huge difference in your recovery, or can, in itself. The uh, usual process here is that that particular patient will see the general surgeon have the diagnosis, whether it be by uh, biopsy or needle biopsy. Once that diagnosis is made, then the patient will discuss in quite, quite a bit of detail with their general surgeon, okay, what's my next step? Is it a lumpectomy? Is it a mastectomy? And so on. Well, once a decision's been made to do, for instance, a modified uh, mastectomy, then they come see me and we discuss their options for reconstruction. This is a computer imaging device that's able to show us in three dimensions what we're expecting to do with the tissues that you have available. And once again, the tissues meaning skin, fatty tissue, the breast tissue, and so on. Well, there's other types of reconstruction as well where we can use the tummy, you know, where there's no implant, or we may t use tissue from the back with a smaller implant or no implant. So just know there's a lot of options there that nowadays uh, there's things that we can do uh, to help you through that difficult process. So it's, I think, a great teaching tool to not uh, only be able to see the skin, 
look what that person's got available to use as far as the reconstruction, but then transfer it uh, three-dimensionally so that the patient and I can sit down and look and see what can we achieve with the breast implant alone or tissue from elsewhere for symmetry and shape, especially symmetry, uh, uh, and sort of give us an idea what to expect down the road. But there's been a lot of changes over the years. I think not just with the types of reconstruction, but even the simpler things like uh, the implant itself, you know, over the years has changed quite a bit. And nowadays the women have uh, choices in the types of implant, and it's usually either a saline filled implant or a gel filled implant. But those have changed, that's changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, now I can actually show you how this thing works, being that though this is a PG uh, audience, uh, we'll just show a face here in three dimension. I can show you how this thing works a little bit, but just know that obviously when we're talking about reconstruction, we're able to do the same thing with the chest to show us again projection, shape, and all those things. As you can see the front view, but being that this is three dimensional, I can sit and move this in many directions, like so, or so, but we talked about contour, for instance. So what we can do is make some changes. For instance, see this neck area? We can do this and then use some paints so we can all have nice skin. Now let's compare these. So as you can see, this is a great teaching tool. Depending on the procedure we may pick, help uh, that patient understand not only the process, but what we may be expecting. And the whole thing here is designed to help give us enough information to get a nice natural look. There's many things we can do nowadays to get over the hump and know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Very important. And um, uh, one thing we found out through a lot of research at MD Anderson was it's devastating enough to go through a mastectomy. But nowadays we have that opportunity to do reconstruction, not only do reconstruction, but do it at the time of their surgery. Hi, welcome to Choice Cancer Care at Las Colinas Cancer Center. The Choice Cancer Care is, is a group of doctors and nurses and physicists and dosimetrists and people coming together to give patients a choice of where they want to go get treated. And we're not Walmart. I mean, we're individuals, we're the corner drugstore, we're out on our own in the world, and we'd like the patients to have a really nice experience and get state-of-the-art care and good attention. Well, there's chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation therapy, and Hi Hippocrates put it very well. He said you can uh, poison it, that's chemotherapy, you can cut it out, that's surgery, or you can burn it, that's radiation therapy. Now, we're not cutting, poisoning, and burning patients today, but it's intricate applications of those modalities learned years and years and years ago that have been refined, progressed, and evolved to the state of the art we have today that can help patients and minimize side effects and improve quality of life for all involved. The big terms we have are benign and malignant. Benign is if there, there's a tumor and it's just sitting around and doesn't do anything. And malignant means it's got the ability to spread. And then if it has the ability to spread, we think of local or metastasized. When a solid tumor is spread someplace else in the body, we say it's metastasized. If the tumor is still local, regional, then the patient's got a much better chance of being cured utilizing surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. Kathy, this is a chemotherapy infusion area. You can see it's a wide open room. It's very bright and we're, you know, it's easy access for patients. They come and go for their chemo. It doesn't have to be so bad with chemo anymore either. We've got much better drugs to make the chemotherapy better tolerated, more palatable for people. Our patients come in, they watch TV, they listen to music, we have Wi-Fi, they do the internet, some of them just sleep, and it's very, it's very wide open, it's very calm and peaceful here. Our nurses are lovely, they're very nurturing and caring people, and I think it makes a very nice environment for healing. So the patient needs to be staged. Staging is the language that doctors use to figure out how far the malignancy is in its natural course of progression. Once the patient's staged, we figure out most cases are curable, 
we discuss treatment options. And if the patient would like to come in for beam radiation therapy, we'll get CAT scans, infuse it to an MRI, and enter the data on the planning computer and program the linear accelerator how to paint the radiation dose in. Right now, we're in the PET-CT scanner, and this is a big, fancy piece of equipment that not only has a typical CAT scanner, but it's called a, a nuclear medicine PET scanner, and it's fused together. And the reason why this is important with the PET scan fused on the CAT scan, it shows areas of inflammation where there's increased metabolism, and it's very sensitive for finding where cancer is. So the patients, a lot of times, if they're diagnosed with cancer, we'll have a staging PET-CT scan so we can do fine diagnostic work. Or if we're treating them with cancer, we can lay them down on this machine exactly in the same position as they are for radiation therapy planning. And then we get this information and put it in the planning computer to program the linear accelerator to treat the patient. Once we capture the images, the images come into the computerized database. And we have here an image of a normal PET-CT scan. You can see the patient's body is moving around in circles and there's a little bit of uptake in the brain or in the kidneys and the bladder where the FDG, the dye went, but that's all normal. Here's an abnormal one. You can see all these splotches of the dark modeling area. This patient had widely disseminated disease in soft tissues and in the bones and, and uh, the patient's quite ill. Okay, we can also go up and down on the images right here and you can see this way that there's cancer in the liver here and and uh, here's the lungs and the, here in the mediastinum and it's in the bone you can see the area where it lights up versus where the other tissues are where there's no um, uptake or cancer so now we can really figure out more thoroughly and precisely where the disease is when the patient presents to us so we can offer different kind of treatments what we do is we need to get the information so that we can program the machine, the linear accelerator, to paint the radiation dose in. So patients will come in in radiation therapy planning position. We have a fully integrated circuit and set up here with the CAT scan and the PET-CT scan, and a lot of times we'll use an MRI, and we fuse the images. And then we take the images and we digitize in on the images where the target is, the target volume, cancer, the cancer-related process, and tissues that really don't benefit by being treated with radiation therapy. Right now we're in the linear accelerator vault, and this is a room enclosed by lead to protect the outside people from radiation getting out. And this is the machine that makes the radiation called a linear accelerator. And it's a radiation-making machine, and the beam of radiation is made and comes out through the head of the equipment. This is the cone beam CT scanner that we utilize to check patient positioning for image guidance when the patient's on the table to make sure they're set up properly in addition to the lasers around the room. We can treat small tumors in somebody's brain. We have new, we do treatments for patients with early lung cancer. They come in this room five times for 10 minutes each time and beam in the radiation therapy with laser precision and sterilize the lung cancer. They never have to open their chest up. Lung cancer is fairly common and the outcomes have been dreary. And so uh, we have a program where the patient brings in $30 and we just do it um, on a cash basis with our doctors and we have a low dose CAT scan and then we can quickly get down to brass tacks and see if anything's going on in their lungs or not and if so it may lead to more uh, intervention and treatment later on if that's necessary. The linear accelerator like I've been showing you, it's treatment from far away, it's called teletherapy. Putting seeds or radioactive materials in a patient's body is called brachytherapy. Brachy means close, so close therapy. And so there's a procedure when you put little radioactive pellets in the prostate and you can do it and it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to make a cloud of radiation like that and it can sterilize the cancer and cure it. It's a different type of treatment than teletherapy and there's different, different treatments for different patients, not one size fits all. I think the patients need to get used to going to the doctors. The ladies are used to going, we've got to get the men to go to. And if you go to the family doctor or the lady goes to the gynecologist, these doctors are all trained regarding when you need to get a routine colonoscopy based on age 50 or when to start your mammograms at age 50. So understanding these signs and symptoms, so if something happens, you know, you go in and get looked at. Like your car, if your car's running funny, you take it to the gas station, you take it to the mechanic, have somebody look at that. Well, your body's your biggest asset you got in addition to your relationships. So if something's not right, to understand what that means, then go in and see somebody and look for a little help and let the doctors help you. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Irving Living. We'll see you next time.